Good afternoon, everyone. Did y'all have a blessed afternoon? Amen. Let's stand as we sing Down at the Cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so one. sweetly abides within there at the cross where he took me in glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood of soul at the Savior's feet, plunge in today and be made complete, glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to Can you say glory to his name tonight? Amen. Amen. If you can't say glory to his name, you may not know his name. His name is Jesus. He's the sweetest name that we know. And if we know how to worship Jesus in spirit and truth, we can rest assured that he appreciates and adores the worship of his children. And so thank you for joining us tonight, those of you that are watching us on Facebook. And it's a privilege to be able to be here on a Sunday night. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. It's a privilege and honor to be in this place of worship. We thank you for those across our nation and across the world that are meeting and worshiping you on a Sunday night. Instead of staying at home and doing the things that they want to do, they are taking an intentional time to be able to worship you. And so bless those that truly seek after you. Lord, encourage those that aren't seeking you during this time to seek you before it's eternally too late. I thank you for every person that's here tonight. We thank you for what you're going to do in our service as we glorify and magnify your holy name. Amen. You may be seated here. Well, it's been a great day already. But how many of you believe that tonight can be just as great as this morning? Amen. I believe it can be. I believe it will be. As you come expecting to hear from the Lord. Now how awesome was it to see Tyler baptized this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And I'll say this before we sing. There are more people that need to come to that understanding. That maybe they've been playing. They need to know who Jesus Christ is. Amen? amen. Now you didn't say amen. But I'll tell you this. Billy Graham said the greatest opportunity to be able to present the gospel today is the church pew. He said over 50% of the people that claim to know Christ still live according to the ways of the world. When I talk to my evangelist friends, they say that when they go and do revivals and they are participating in crusades, that about half the people that still get saved today are church members and some of them are leaders in the church. But they come to that realization that they did not know Christ. And how awesome is that before it's eternally too late? Never be ashamed of Jesus, and he'll never be ashamed of you. As we sing, let's not be ashamed of Jesus tonight. Let us sing, Amazing Grace.
and obey. saying 10,000 reasons.
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you once again for another day, Lord. We thank you for the privilege that we can gather in your house and worship you, Lord. We just ask that you place your hand on Brother Nathan, Lord, as he gives your message, Lord, and may we receive it, Lord, and use it throughout our lives. And forgive us for where we fail you, Lord, and we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Are y'all excited to be here tonight? I'm excited to be here. I love Sunday nights. I love the entire day where we can come together to worship the Lord. Now, most of you realize tonight that there are storms in the sea. Storms in the sea, riots in the streets, and sickness all around us. I even watched the other night a journalist tell us that they are organizing a group of people to seriously investigate, are you ready for this, UFOs. The journalist said this could be more important than the election that's coming up. And he said it with a straight face. Are you having a difficult time right now? We find out today that suicides are up, depression is up. Many people, even Christians, are having a difficult time with all the things that we are facing. Most people are really afraid. If you ask them, are you afraid right now? If they're being honest with you, many of them will say that they're afraid. So what do we do? Well, let's turn to Psalm 27 and see what David did. Psalm 27 as many of you know, this is one of my favorite psalms. I have many that I like to go to and read. But Psalm 27 in my life has provided encouragement and hope when we face uncertain days. Psalm 27, beginning in verse 1, listen to these words very carefully. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Listen to verse 5. For in time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion and the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above all my enemies all around me. 
Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, listen to these words very carefully. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. We thank you for the truth of your word and how we can look at the life of David and see how you guided him and protected him in his own life. And Lord Jesus, you'll do the same for us and help us to see that plainly and clearly tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you face difficult circumstances in life, what do you do? Sometimes people run to the bottle. They run to the bottle and say, alcohol will help me through the difficult circumstances in life. But alcohol will leave them empty-handed. It is not wise to consume alcohol. and They will fill that void in their life thinking if they they can only just medicate their body, they will not feel the pain as much as they have. Some people run to pills. And let me tell you this, in our nation today, doctors are very adamant about prescribing pills to people and saying, this pill will fix your problem. I'm so glad David didn't take pills. He didn't have to have annex to to keep him where he needed to be. In fact, David was up and down, up and down. But it was through those trials and troubles in life that he completely learned to put his trust in Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you don't think that your family is going to always be there for you because family will come and go. Family, depending on the circumstances in your life, they may be there to support you or they may forsake you altogether. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But the one constant that we always have in our lives as Christians is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope that you recognize this so Christians don't be afraid. Let's look at the life of David tonight to see when we face difficult circumstances, what we can do. First of all, listen to this carefully. First of all, if our salvation is eternally secure, whom or what shall we fear? If our salvation is eternally secure, whom or what shall we fear? David understood that his salvation was in the Lord. And my friends, our hearts should not fear because David said here, God is our light. He is our salvation. He is our strength. F.B. Meyer said the trusting soul lives behind a triple door. A triple door. When we understand this triple door, we realize that God is light, salvation, and strength. My friends, he's all that we need. And our salvation is secured in him. The devil himself cannot even take our salvation away. And when we are secured in Christ, we understand that God can deliver us physically and spiritually. Now, let me just be on record here tonight. Spiritually matters most. When Jesus was about his earthly ministry... He was most interested in meeting their spiritual need, but oftentimes he would meet their physical need. He was concerned about them. He was compassionate about them. 
But he wanted to make sure that they were eternally secure, that they realized that their salvation was most important to him. And let me ask you, dear friend, in these times in which we're, we're living, are you making it an intention in your own life to make sure that people are spiritually where they need to be? Because if they're not spiritually where they need to be, then that may explain why many people are committing suicide, even people within the church. They're depressed, they're discouraged, they're wondering what's going on. And it's hard for us to imagine that they would reach the point of desperation where they would even take their own life. And that's why we need to encourage them to look to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many of them know that. But when they look at their circumstances surrounding them, they think that this is a hopeless situation. They look at their life and say, my life is hopeless. But my dear friends, David understood that God is light, he is salvation, he is strength. And how many of us could testify tonight that God always takes care of us? Always. Don't you ever forget that. Our past experiences remind us that in the present and in the future, God is going to take care of us. That's why you can put your head on the pillow at night and, and sleep and say, To God be the glory for great things he's done. He is never sleeping or slumbering. He is always awake, wanting to work and to move in our lives. The troubles that we experience today will help us with the troubles that we experience tomorrow. David knew about trouble. Jesus knew about trouble. The Bible says about Jesus that he was a man of many sorrows. He had difficulties in his life. But through it all, he was concerned about having the Father's will done in him and through him. Now, when wicked people come against us, what will we do? David had some wicked people come against him. and They wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. But God had a plan and purpose for his life. And let me assure you this. No one is ever going to take your life if God doesn't allow it. When we think about the life of David... God had anointed him to be the next king, and when he was facing wickedness, when he was facing his enemies, I'm sure he was reminded that God anointed him to be the next king. And so let me assure you this, if God has said in our lives that this is what he's going to accomplish, this is what he's going to do, our life is not going to be wasted. Our life is going to be used for the glory and honor of God. When war was upon him, he sought the Lord and he put his trust in him. And so let me ask you this tonight. Do you have the personal assurance of your salvation? I believe when you know without a shadow of a doubt, when you take your last breath here on this earth, that you're going to heaven to be in the presence of the Lord forever, that makes a difference in how we live our daily lives. We don't live in fear. We live trusting in the Lord for our salvation. And when God has given us salvation, no one can take it away from us. Uh, there are some people that they believe that at the last minute, if they were to utter a cuss word, then automatically they are damned to hell. That's not eternal security of the believer. That's not assurance of salvation. Hopefully, None of you will do that, right? You say, oh, praise God, I hope I don't. But let me tell you this. Our salvation is secured in Jesus. David understood that. Secondly, know this. If our eternal home is in heaven, who do we turn to in time of need? Now watch people, observe people. Not in a judgmental way but in a way of trying to help them and to encourage them. When they go through troubles in life, when they have needs, who do they turn to? Now, I'm so thankful for my wife, Melanie, and our kids. So thankful for them. And I confide in her, and I 
seek her for counsel in certain situations. But most importantly, I seek the counsel of God. And if she's in line with the scriptures, then, then what we discuss and what we talk about is in line with God's word. But I have seen situations and I've had experiences where I am trying to counsel someone in a spiritual, biblical way. And they say, well, I talked to my spouse about this and this is what they said I should do. Contradicting the word of God entirely. Now, who do we go to in time of need, in time of help? I think it's important that we take our lesson here from David. Listen to verse 4. The Bible says, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Our eternal home is in heaven. And we don't want to waste our troubles that we experience here in life. And that's a sad thing, right? To just waste your troubles. We have troubles. We have difficulties that we're dealing with. But our troubles should lead us to worship. Listen to me very carefully. Don't miss this. Pass this on to your friends and your family. Trouble should lead us to worship, not to neglect worship. Let me say that again. Trouble in our life should lead us to worship Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, not to lead us away from worship. We draw near to him, and he draws near to us. If we neglect our spiritual responsibility to worship, it only hurts us, and it hurts people that are around us. Because the truth is, we're not looking to the right person for our help. When we worship God, he reveals you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. You say, well, if I have nothing to fear, why do I fear so much? When you begin to worship God, you begin to recognize who he is and that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. My friends, he can speak. And as we see in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, he is going to just speak Jesus Christ and armies will be destroyed just because he says the words. Just because he speaks it, it happens. And how many of you realize tonight he can speak into our lives and good things can happen? He is all powerful. Our confidence is in him. Now let me tell you something. Some of you are putting more confidence in politicians to get us out of the mess that we're in. But let me tell you, our confidence should be in Jesus Christ. We trust in him. He's the one that appoints kings and rulers. He appoints them and he can also cause them to fall. Our trust is in Jesus. We pray for those people in authority and in leadership. The psalmist David said, how beautiful is the Lord in verse 4. How beautiful is Jesus to you? You say, oh, I'm, I'm not really wrapped up in those kind of things, preacher. Uh, beauty has, has no appeal to me. But listen, his beauty transfers to our face. So I'm looking at your face tonight, okay? Some of you, I don't think, maybe really comprehend how important it is to recognize the beauty and the glory of who King Jesus is because when you recognize his beauty, it transfers to your face. You say, where you get that, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Turn to Psalm 90, verse 17. Psalm 90, verse 17. Listen to these words. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Moses knew something about the beauty and majesty of God being on the mountain with God. And the Bible says, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon who? Us. Be upon us. And establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. If God's beauty is upon us, then 
people will look at us and see the radiance of God just like they saw it upon the life of Moses. Moses said, let him work through our hands, our work, our labor for God. What David is saying here, he says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He's saying this, God's presence is God's house. Can you go to a place, dear friend, and experience the presence of God? Can you sense it? Can you know it? I'll be honest with you. I could go into places and we start to worship the Lord and you can start to sense his presence. And you say the glory of the Lord is moving and working in our lives. The Holy Spirit indwells in us, but he's moving and working among us. But have you ever been to a place where it seemed like something was missing? People weren't moved by the message or the invitation and their time of response. They said, oh, I'm not interested in that. I can take it or leave it. The truth is, dear friend, one day, because they have left it, they are going to experience what God has in store for them. But he loved them. He gave his son for them, but they rejected him, and they'll experience hell forever. David is saying, really... We need to get back to the basics. He says that we need to have this single focus. One thing I have desired of the Lord. Uh, We live in a day and age where people compliment themselves on multitasking. Yet you can only really do one thing at a time. The single focus that we are supposed to have as believers, as David did is to live for the glory and honor of God. And when we have that single focus in our life, we can see what Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Listen to this. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Tonight, what are you pressing forward to? What's your goals? What's your ambitions in life? And first of all, your goal and your ambition in life is to glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I can assure you, based upon the promises of God, that if that is your goal, that is your ambition, God has great things in store for you. That doesn't mean that we're going to experience life without sorrows or trouble or difficulties. That means if our life is lived for the glory and honor of God, every day it makes a difference in how you live your life. You look for opportunities to glorify Jesus. You look for opportunities to say to your friend that you love so much, That doesn't know Jesus, let me tell you about Jesus. You look for that neighbor or friend that you can invite to church that you know doesn't have a church home, and you say, Hey, why don't you come to my church and I'll be with you, I will sit with you, and I'll be praying for you. When we lose that single focus and we're distracted by the cares and the desires of this world, my friends, that's why. Many people are struggling and having difficulties with what's going on. David says the Lord's house is a place to be in time of trouble. To be in his presence. To know who he is in time of trouble. I'll tell you this as I think about it. Just imagine the king of kings and the Lord of lords being inside of you and being with you when you face the troubles in life. If you could see Jesus face to face, would you be afraid? Would you be fearful? You say, oh, oh no, preacher. Jesus has got my back. He's right there with me. Let me tell you, even though you may not be able to see Jesus, 
The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave. The Holy Spirit has the ability to move and work in our lives just like he did after Jesus ascended up into heaven. Jesus says, greater things you will do than what I did here on this earth. My friends, that's a place to, to drop your pen and say, wow, really? Let's get after it. But yet, as we look at the circumstances in our life, we need to know God will protect us from harm, even if it is his will. He will protect us from, his, from harm if it is his will. Now, do you believe that tonight? Tommy Glenn, do you believe that? I believe that, sir. I believe that in my life. Melanie believes that in her life. No matter what we face in life, if God wants to touch us, if he wants to, to heal us, and he wants to help us, it's his plan, his purpose in our life. And we trust in him. And we know that he will be there to protect us. David said he will praise us to the Lord. And let me tell you this. The Bible says to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen? Joyful noise. When you start singing praises to the Lord, even though you may not be able to sing on key, hey, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And when you start praising the Lord, you'll step out into a situation and say, God can do anything. And you start thinking about heaven and how in just a moment you can be in glory with Jesus Christ. And then you realize how insignificant all these things are. And yet we deal with people today that call themselves Christians, yet they're living in fear and worry. There is no greater safety when the believer hides in God. Verse 5 says, For in time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Struggles strengthen us in life. They don't make us weaker. Have you been struggling lately? And you say, God, you're allowing this to happen in my life. These struggles are going to make me stronger. Because you've heard this, right? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. If our hope is in the Lord, our trust is in him, we know that he can provide everything that we need. Thirdly, if our cries are to the Lord, why fear the circumstances? When we're crying to the Lord for help, why do we fear the circumstances? David said, we seek the face of the Lord. Verse 8, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. I want you to think about this. I want you to talk to people about this. Who are you seeking after? Who are you seeking after? Now, maybe when you were in a courting relationship and, and you were seeking after a spouse, hey, you were putting your best foot forward, right? Maybe. But when you're seeking after something, you're wanting to be able to have that. And so when it comes to our God, our Father, he told David, he said, to seek after me. And as we seek after his face, know this. When we seek the face of, the, of God, how do we pray? Do you cry out to him? Do you ask him in your present circumstances to make you stronger? Because let me tell you, you can have conversations with people. You can talk to people. And some people that call themselves Christians are not praying during this time. They spend more time watching the 24 hours news cycle and, and looking for some hope, some security, some good news out there that's going to make them feel better about everything that we're going through. But when you get on your knees and pray, you know, as Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, 
Turn there if you would. This will encourage you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Listen to these words carefully. The Bible says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who is that? That's our shepherd. He wants what is best for us. The Lord gathers the lambs. He doesn't forsake them. He gently draws them to himself. And the shepherd says, hey, I got this all taken care of. Any wolves come our way? I'll deal with those wolves. Any danger that you may find yourself in, I will protect you. I will guide you. I am the great shepherd. I am the chief shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And so this is what we do. Pursue God's presence in order to experience his favor and fellowship. His favor and fellowship. We pursue his presence and are you doing that? Are you seeking after the Lord and saying, Lord, whatever you provide for me, it's all that I need. Now, you may have heard this. Some people are waiting for a vaccine. They say that they're not going to be doing certain things until there's a vaccine. Now, we pray to the Lord and ask him to give us those things. But what if he doesn't? I believe honestly it is going to happen. But let me tell you this. I'm trusting in the Lord more than I'm trusting in a vaccine for my safety. Now some of you have a hard time with that. But I can tell you with honesty of heart, with purity of heart, I trust the Lord more than I trust a vaccine. I'll tell you a funny story. This happened in my own family, and I've shared it with Roger. Uh, my granddaddy, who was well up in years, used to go and get the flu shot. And after he started getting the flu shot, the first time he got it, within a couple of days, he was laid up in the bed. He was, as we say, sick as a dog. Sick. He told my mom, he said, I, I'm thinking that maybe that, that shot gave me the flu, but I'm not 100% sure. My doctor says I need it, and so I'll take it. Next year, same thing. He took that flu shot, and within a day or two, back in the bed, sick as a dog. He said, I am thoroughly convinced. I think that that is giving me the flu. The next year rolled around and he talked to his doctor and his doctor said, Hey, you need to take this shot. You're well up in age. You need this shot. So he took it again. You know what happened, right? Laid up in the bed. Sick. He said, I knew I shouldn't have took that shot. I knew I shouldn't have took it, but I did. Next year rolled around. Doctor said, Hey, you need to take this shot. You're well advanced in years. You need it. You know what he said? No way, Jose. I'm taking my chances. I'm going to deal with it. And guess what happened? As long as he lived the rest of the years that he had, no flu. Let me ask you this. Do you trust in the doctors more than you do the great physician? I've been in rooms where the medical doctors walk in to tell families about the current situation that they're getting ready to face. And I want to tell you, they have laser focus. They're listening to every word that the doctor says. They want to know if there's a cure, if there's going to be healing. Is there hope? And I'll tell you this. That medical doctor can be used by the Lord to do the best that he can do. But all healing comes from Jesus Christ. You say, oh, preacher, I don't believe that. Get in your Bible, read your Bible, 
and you'll see that God is the great physician. He's the one that can touch our lives. So what do we do? David, quickly, he cried out to God for help. How many of you believe, be honest, Rayburn, that Jesus can heal all diseases? He can. I've seen him heal people's lives. I've seen him touch them. Last time I read my Bible, he can heal all diseases. He has the power over all things because he's Jesus. He is the one that can make the plague and virus go away if he wants to. You remember the plagues in Egypt? Many of them. But God was in control of that situation just like he's in control of this situation. Now David understood no matter what he faces, God will never leave us or forsake us. You believe that tonight? He'll never leave you or forsake you. David understood that God fills the gaps. We are not void of his care. He wants what is best for us. Now, I'll just mention something real quickly here. I won't spend too much time on it. But I heard last week people saying, we need to just trust in science. Let me tell you this. Science has to catch up with the Bible. Science is learning new technology, new things every day. Science is constantly changing. I'm not trusting in science. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. You say, oh, preacher, come on now. You write it down. I'll sign it for you. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. Now let me get to point four quickly. If our trust is in the Lord, do we remember we aren't meant to live here forever? Oh, me. We're not meant to live here forever. Our bodies are frail. They are but dust. But how many times do we see people wanting to continue to hold on to this world, to say this world is great? And that's why not too long ago I said that Christians spend more time praying to keep people out of heaven than they do the lost out of hell. Who do you spend more time praying for? Your family member, your friend that's lost and going to hell? Or somebody that you know that's 110 years old and when they die, they're going to heaven? How awesome is that? Real quickly, I'll tell you a story. When Dr. Potts found out that he was only supposed to have two and a half weeks to live, we were in a setting in his living room and he was telling all of our classmates there, I only have about two weeks to live, two and a half weeks to live. It's what the doctor told me. This is what his diagnosis is. And he called on one of the guys in the room to pray. The guy in the room loves the Lord. So he's praying, Lord, please heal Dr. Potts. Touch his body so that he can minister to us and so he can pour into our lives. And after he got through praying, I thought, man, amen, that was awesome. Dr. Potts looked him in the eyes and said, don't you be praying against me. I'm ready to go to heaven right now. And I reminded him after he lived six and a half years after that, God must have answered his prayer and not answered your prayer. You had more work to do, more things to do for Jesus Christ. And so listen to this. David says, teach me, verse 11, if we stand with Jesus, we can expect enemies. Expect enemies if we stand with Jesus. And so verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, I want to focus on this for a moment here. Waiting on the Lord. It's easier to act. 
You say, well, I'm not waiting. I'm just acting. I just got to do something. Oh, be very careful, dear friend. Be very careful. Even lay down and die, some people say. I, I will do that. Or run with friends instead of waiting. Listen to me. David is saying, God is saying to him, waiting on God is the best posture to be holding. Waiting is not passive, but it's an engagement with life's challenges. And we hope for deliverance when we're going through difficulties in life. You say, well, preacher, what happens if you don't wait and God tells you to wait? Turn real quickly, real quickly. Last set of verses we'll go to. 1 Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, and you can go home and look at this unlawful sacrifice that King Saul gave. First Samuel chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened... As soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came and Saul went out to greet him, that he might greet him, that he might meet him, and that he might greet them. In verse 11 here, and Samuel said, what have I done? Saul said, what I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to them. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. King Saul couldn't wait. So you know what it cost him? His kingdom. But let me tell you, in the providence of God, God had a young boy waiting. He didn't realize it, but God was going to use that young boy to be a man after his own heart. And so tonight, understand that Saul feared that the people were scattering, and so he took matters into his own hands. He wasn't willing to wait on God. Listen to me carefully. Always do what God says to do. Let me say it again. Always do what God says to do. Always. Love is patient. It knows that true love waits. And when we wait on the Lord and we trust in Him, He's working his plan. Always trust him. Do you trust him tonight? With your life? With your health? With your happiness? Do you trust the Lord? David trusted the Lord. And he will strengthen our hearts. And we will not faint. We will not grow weary. We will trust in the Lord. And he will help us every step of the way. Tonight, are you afraid? Do you know of people around you that are afraid and concerned and worried? I can tell you that the closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize that you have nothing to fear. He calms our fears. He takes away our worries. He's bigger than the boogeyman. With every head bowed, every eye closed, let me ask you tonight, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know Him? Do you have the assurance of your salvation? 
that you know 100% that if you are to take your last breath here on earth, that you would spend eternity in heaven with the Lord because you've trusted in Jesus for your salvation. You've trusted in him because of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary when he died. But he resurrected the third day. If you don't know Jesus, trust in him. Give your life entirely to him. And that will be the best life that you can live. One devoted to Jesus, trusting and obeying him. You say, well, preacher, I know him. But I'm not sure that I'm completely devoted to living for him. My friend, if you know him and you trust in him, he has great things in store for us. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to live each day for him. And so decide tonight. From this night forward, I'm going to be totally surrendered to you, Lord Jesus. No matter what I face, no matter what I go through, Jesus, I'm going to trust in you. And he will provide, he will help us. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the privilege and honor to be able to worship you tonight. Lord Jesus, we trust in you. Lord, we exercise this, this caution and this wisdom that you've given us. But Lord, we also know that you're the one that controls our lives. Our life is in your hands. Lord Jesus, you know the days of our lives are numbered. And you know when we'll take our last breath. So Lord, help us to live devoted to you. Not fearful, not afraid, but trusting in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand. I want you to come and do business with the Lord. As Melanie plays, you come. Amen. Without Jesus, how lost I would be. Amen. That I want you to just take a seat here quickly. So great to be in the house of the Lord on this Sunday night. Hasn't it been good? Amen. Now, I'm already sweating up here. I got so fired up tonight. Want to encourage you. Wanting to see you strengthened in the Lord. And I'll tell you this. People say, well, what do you do on a Sunday night? Because you realize that a lot of people, a lot of people now, even in Southern Baptist life, they decided to just cross Sunday night out and say, hey, it's a lost cause. He said, what do you do on a Sunday night? I tell them this, I preach on Sunday night just like I do on Sunday morning. Give everything I have. Study, prepared, preach the truth. And leave it up to you to decide what you're going to do with the Word of God. Those of you that have watched tonight, thank you for being a part of our service. Have a wonderful week.